Hello, everyone. I am uh, Nolan Higdon. I'm one of the founders and organizers of the Critical Media Literacy Conference of the Americas. And nice to see everyone and, and glad you showed up. Um, we're going to get started in just a moment here. Before we do, I want to make sure everyone um, recognizes the uh, interpretation feature on Zoom. So there's a little globe at the bottom of your screen where you can turn on uh, your preferred language, and that way you'll be able to uh, hear from everybody today. Uh, I'll be speaking in, in this session as, as well as others. Um, uh, what I want to do um, now is I'm going to turn it over to my, my co-host, um, a phenomenal leader, a phenomenal uh, co-organizer. If I should turn out to be half uh, the leader she is, I'll, I'll die with a smile on my face. Uh, Alicia? Muchas gracias por tu generosidad, Nolan, y digo lo mismo de ti. Esta oportunidad me ha hecho aprender muchísimo. Muchísimas gracias. Quiero darles a todos las bien, la bienvenida y también, como Nolan, asegurarme de que esté funcionando para ustedes la traducción. Eh, los que solamente me están escuchando en español, sepan que tienen debajo un mundito pequeño donde señalando esa opción podrán elegir el idioma en el que quieren escuchar la conferencia, esta transmisión. Tengan a bien avisarnos por chat si esto está funcionando y podemos comenzar. Gracias, Nolan. Welcome, everyone. As settler colonialism is not solely in the past, but is instead an ongoing process that is created and recreated through daily actions and embedded in the systems and structures we currently live in and in which we participate, we acknowledge the original caretakers of the lands on which we stand. For those of us who are physically close to where I stand now, we acknowledge that we are on the land of the Tongva Gabriela Enyo and the Ashaman Juan Enyo nations who have lived and continue to live here. We acknowledge that these lands have always been sites of teaching, of learning, of wisdom. We recognize the Tongva and the Ashaman nations and their spiritual connection as the first stewards and the traditional caretakers of this land. We thank them for their strength, perseverance, and resistance. As many of us are currently physically distant from one another, as we begin the second annual Critical Media Literacy Conference of the Americas, we invite you to acknowledge the first peoples on the land on which you stand. If this applies to you, if you would like to begin to learn more about the first peoples on the land, people who continue to live on the land which you occupy. Please see the link posted in the chat. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Noah. Bueno, mi nombre es Alicia Holguín y desde este extremo de estas latitudes, Tierra del Fuego, Antártida, Islas del Atlántico, Sur en Argentina, les doy la bienvenida eh, a este espacio. La organización de este segundo Congreso de Literacidad Crítica Mediática se enmarca en el centenario del natalicio del pedagogo brasilero, del pedagogo crítico brasilero Paulo Freire. En tal sentido, adherimos a sus ideales y nos cuestionamos permanentemente de qué manera resignificar sus postulados, sus conceptualizaciones, sus enseñanzas en la actualidad. Por otra parte, el contexto de pandemia nos hizo pensar en la mejor manera de llegar a todas las personas, por lo que tuvimos eh, que realizar cambios durante la organización a cada momento. Quienes de manera voluntaria nos sumamos para construir los principales ideales que aquí se desarrollarán, entendemos que, paradójicamente, 
uno de los aspectos más favorables de este lamentable hito histórico propició la democratización del acceso al saber, la circulación del conocimiento, la apertura a la escucha, la circulación de la palabra y el acercamiento entre las personas de distintos orígenes, formaciones, edades y lugares muy distantes entre sí. La incorporación de lenguas como praxis concreta de inclusión ha sido otra de las decisiones que esperamos sostener, pliar cada vez más. A partir de cada encuentro, sumamos más y más personas comprometidas con la construcción de un posicionamiento y pensamiento que nos permita analizar críticamente la realidad que transmiten los medios de comunicación, así como discutir los tradicionales discursos hegemónicos de ámbitos como el educativo, el cultural, el político, el social. Gracias, Nolan. Thank you, Alicia. <coughs> Um, for those who are, are attending uh, this for the first year or, or uh, don't know this from uh, the previous year, uh, the idea for this conference actually came up with an idea that I, I just sort of floated by um, Jeff while we were at another conference. And um, <clears throat> from there, a great partnership developed. Um, Jeff was highly interested in, in bringing this to fruition. And we put together a list of names of people we thought maybe a couple of them will want to do it. And we were... Um, overwhelmed by the support and interest that people had for developing a conference like this. And uh, the group of people who, who came together were incredible. Um, they, we valued um, equality, plurality, democracy, and, and we engaged in a very important process of, of community building, which was crucial through the pandemic. Um, these long phone calls and Zoom calls and, and email threads Um, and going back and forth, this conference was uh, back in 2020, it was supposed to be in person and the pandemic, we went online, we thought we might have this one in person and we switched it to online. Um, and <clears throat> it was quite a complex process, but it was um, wonderful to engage in. It's a great community of, of volunteers. Uh, we experienced things together. I remember the night RBG passed, we were on a call together. So we heard about Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing as a group. Um, we dealt with the news of <clears throat> YouTube um, removing our conference online as, as a group. So there was a lot of great um, moments today. It's, it's a fabulous community that supports each other, both professionally and, and personally, and honored to be a part of it. And we are honored to, to bring you this um, conference. And we hope to do it and plan to do it every year moving forward. And if you'd like to, to volunteer and join the community, please do reach out to us. Um, we'd love to have you. Um, Now I'm going to, uh, with that in mind, one of the uh, coolest things we did together as a group is we collaboratively worked on creating a detailed definition of critical media literacy. And Alicia is going to now introduce that for us. Así es, gracias Nolan. Esta construcción colectiva acordó que la literacidad crítica mediática tiene como objetivo interactuar críticamente con los medios mediante el examen de representaciones, sistemas, estructuras, ideologías y las dinámicas de poder que dan forma y reproducen la cultura y la sociedad. Es un proceso basado en la investigación para analizar y crear medios interrogando las relaciones entre el poder y el conocimiento. La literacidad crítica mediática es un proceso dialógico para la justicia social y ambiental que incorpora la noción de praxis de Paulo Freire, reflexión y acción sobre el mundo para transformarlo. Este proyecto pedagógico cuestiona las representaciones de clase, género, etnia, sexualidad y otras formas de identidad y desafía los mensajes que producen la opresión y la discriminación. Celebra las representaciones positivas y los aspectos benéficos de los medios, al mismo tiempo que desafía los problemas y las consecuencias negativas, reconociendo que los medios nunca son neutrales. La literacidad crítica mediática es una pedagogía transformadora 
para desarrollar y empoderar a personas críticas, solidarias y conscientes. Habiendo construido esta definición en forma colectiva, quisiera ahora que Nolan nos cuente y explique un poco cuáles fueron los propósitos de esta, de esta organización. Um, so I want to, um, thank you, Alicia, for reading that. I want to um, also include some um, uh, thank yous. Uh, I think it's really important that we, we thank all the folks who made this um, conference possible. Uh, it's important to note that this is an all volunteer organization. Um, no one's paid for the work they do. And uh, Lisa and I are honored and privileged enough to be kind of the faces of the welcoming panel today, but there, there's an army of people behind us who made this possible. Um, and again, they were all volunteers. Um, we, uh, you know, we wanted to, to make this free of charge. It was really important to us not to have any outside money uh, that could possibly influence the conference. It was also very important that we made the conference free of charge, especially when it's online. Um, but the, uh, even the original hosting campus, California State University East Bay um, communications department chair, Dr. Mary Cardero, she strived to make it um, free as well. So. It was a big focus of this group to, to um, put in a tons of our time and labor um, to make this event free of charge so you could all attend. And so um, I want to make sure that we all thank the conference organizing committee, uh, California State University East Bay, uh, University of California, Los Angeles did so much for us, um, sponsoring organizations, especially the, the Critical Media Project and the Media Freedom Foundations. Um, all the interpreters, the translators, the, the student volunteers who are running all the Zoom sessions. Um, we owe them all a great, great um, debt of gratitude. And in addition, uh, we also want to thank um, some, some people in particular who really uh, you know, just went above and beyond. And Alicia and I will go, go through some of these folks. I want to thank uh, Andrea Gambino. Uh, for the incredible work, uh, just keeping us all on track um, with social media, registration, Zoom, uh, checking in, keeping us organized. Thank you very much, Andrea. Agradecemos también a Pedro Pávez Gamboa por toda la organización que tuvo lugar con los intérpretes para que realmente este congreso sea inclusivo. So I want to thank Miranda McKee, uh, all the incredible work uh, that you did to take these, these complex um, plans we had to do digitally. And you, you made them very simple for us all to understand and participate. So big thank you to Miranda McKee. Agradecemos especialmente a Inés Gómez, quien dirige un instituto de la modalidad especial y quien está garantizando la inclusión de aquellas personas que no pueden escucharnos eh, a través de la lengua de señas y todos sus estudiantes que la acompañan. Muchísimas gracias, Inés. I also want to thank Noah Golden for all the work on the opening, closing session, land acknowledgement, and, and always bringing much needed uh, optimism to, to many conversations. Thank you, Noah. Queremos agradecer especialmente a Michael Hoesman desde Canadá, quien constantemente nos acompañó con un pensamiento positivo, con ideas brillantes, con perspectivas críticas. Eh, realmente hemos conocido a una persona maravillosa. Muchas gracias, Michael. Mi debt of gratitude is owed to Amina Humphrey. Um, Amina made sure that there was space for artists to participate in this conference. Uh, also um, designed these very crucial spaces, these salons, which we're all going to get to and get to enjoy. And, and Amina really worked uh, tirelessly to make that happen. So thank you, Amina. Me toca agradecer especialmente, y creo que una de las palabras que lo caracterizan es su Grata personalidad, el amor y la pasión con la que organiza a las personas para que esto sea posible. Chef Shar, quien fue parte de esta gran unión que, que posibilita este congreso. Thank you very much, Chef.
Indeed. Uh, thank you very much to Allison Trope, always bringing uh, much needed uh, intelligence, wit, and um, website help and, and posting all these things on the web. Thank you so much, Allison Trope of the Critical Media Project. Yo quiero agradecer ahora a Justin Brown, quien también es con una, un humor siempre positivo y un diseño y creatividad increíble, pudo captar las ideas de todos, aportando estos logos, el diseño, la imagen institucional que representa a este congreso y sus ideales, eh, además de eh, participar activamente en la organización de casi todo. Big thank you to RP Gant for all the work um, with all the complexities of uh, digital organizations and, and getting us all on board and explaining things to so much. Thank you so much, RP. Agradecemos a Alison Butler de la Universidad de Massachusetts, también quien realizó importantísimos aportes para lograr la construcción de este colectivo que, como dijo Nolan, pretendemos que siga ampliándose para permanecer en el tiempo y que sean acciones que realmente tengan impacto en el cambio social, global y mundial. And uh, last but not least, Jennifer Ramos, want to thank you as well. Uh, again, um, just carrying such a heavy load uh, with all the, the social media, the, the organization, Zoom, and explaining all this stuff and organizing it for all of us. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And thank you to all of you for attending as well. Um, what, we, what we plan on um, doing now is to um, just review the uh, schedule so everyone knows um, how to access the different sessions and, and where they can find help and um, necessary information for navigating the conference. And uh, Andrea has put the um, visual schedule in the chat. Um, so make sure you, you save that, that link. It's, it's all over our websites and it's been in your email, but it's right there as well. You're gonna need that for the next um, couple of days. <clears throat> so uh, just to help folks kind of navigate uh, this comprehensive visual schedule, um, the conference is, is three days. It's today, Saturday and, and Sunday. And to make sure you're on the right date, always check the far left. That's where you'll find um, the dates listed. So you can see on what's on the screen right there, we have today's date, which is October 15th. And then right next door, we have um, the various time zones that are being in that session as well. Um, so as long as you know your time zone or your time zone in relation to one of those, um, you should be able to figure out um, when an event is being held. Then as you move over to your right, um, in, in the middle there, you'll see the panelists and um, panel titles. Uh, and that information, if you wanna find someone again, um, is in the middle of the doc. On, on both sides of that are Zoom links. So you can, to your left, you can see the number one has a Zoom button underneath. You can click on it there, as well as um, the alphabetical letters uh, to the left. And then on the right, you have the direct um, URLs as well. Um, some of these um, sessions are bilingual, some have an interpretation features. Um, to determine which language it is, right next to that URL on the right, you'll see the different languages. It also tells you if interpretation is possible for that particular session. It also tells you um, which language that session is in. And if you're looking at this, this document and you're thinking it's, it's very complex, um, you know, what happens if I run into trouble? Um, you'll see the giant blue help boxes on the left. At any time during the conference, you can click that box and you will be brought to a Zoom room uh, where a very knowledgeable volunteer um, can help you find whatever it is you're looking for. 
And so uh, we hope that this comprehensive document is helpful. Um, obviously, if you have any, any questions or concerns, please do use the, the help feature. I'm now going to uh, turn it over to Alicia. Me gustaría hacer una pregunta, Nolan, respecto de cómo puedo saber el horario de acuerdo con mi país. Yo creo, Alicia, si, um, si uh, Nolan, uh, she's asking if you could show how you would know what country is what time zone. So maybe if you could just explain the time zones. Um, sure. Do you want to put the uh, document back up? I could do that. Gracias. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the particular time zones are, are listed um, next to the date. And Jeff can show that with the um, mouse there. And then um, next to it has the, the time for that time zone. So if you live in that, um, in that time zone, um, you can see the corresponding time next door. Um, the uh, PDT is the Pacific um, time zone. EST is the Eastern time zone. Um, ART is the um, uh, Argentinian time. And um, C, uh, CEST is Central European um, time zone. And then I'll turn it over to Alicia unless there's other questions. Clarísimo. Muchas gracias. Esto ayudará mucho a poder participar de las distintas sesiones. Y ahora me gustaría retomar la apertura que NOA realizó eh, para presentarles un trabajo que se ha desarrollado con muchísimo cuidado, pero sobre todo basado en el amor y en el acuerdo de todo el colectivo de personas que pensamos este congreso para hacer un gran agradecimiento a la Madre Tierra, un gran agradecimiento a la Pachamama, y antes de la proyección quiero decir que especialmente trabajaron para que esta producción sea posible Gustavo Tepetla y Gabriela Romero. Así que Quiero agradecer especialmente todo el trabajo realizado y los invitamos a compartir esta producción. Nuestra vida se inició en este suelo. Sobre nosotros viven nuestros ancestros. Hombres animales, tigres, pájaros y tocuajos. Este territorio es nuestro hogar. Este territorio es nuestro hogar. Debemos protegerlo. Ah, bueno, chams, yam, yam, mi, 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 Ich betrage Windsor Gianco. Und dann ist ja nicht das Kostumblatt. Kon muss nach Minder Mati Makese Jung, den Nachkopf, den Mati Nöko Jung, Chamsen Nachkopf, den Chamsen Mutaga in Windsor Gain, zu Java, Itnerin, zu Java, zu Apoch, zu Java, Java Kong, Anach, kommt dann. Ja, ist ja ein Dungat, dann ja Windsor Gemayat. 
kuyo petaga ichi petaga moka shuk kon mi winzo ge mayach bando ne cham cham ze na ka pshan na utsa cham ze petaga cha ba ne a hu ki cham ze hu kyo petaga in cham ze meska long ti hach na de petaga in cham ze na de ba na de u ka cham de de ya us ya yan ya na 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 shte cha sho tiam bes kon et ya kyo kyo ho de cha ni bjam na o ka ma cha ba cha ba ka sai ta net min ya ya pa ti ya zu po cha ba kon ga na ch min pa na di sho ni cha ba ma ska lung cha ba hu yung ti ha cho cha ba cha ba di bjam te bu ta gen cha ba cha ba ka sai yung cha kyo kyo ha ta net min ya da tu na de ya kon et ya ya kyo kyo ho de ya Dengan jam us, dengan windy am doya pukai. Kuiti jaga tatian, nusa kari calayu taka. Tukhuk tuk mugu nari naskap naton. Lang no, sama hezanya orang, ihat sahun kare ina ma iwela. Giamin wit nanti abzan nang, jamin dah tuh sana kisli. Takau kubi nyani hiku ba ya hia no hete ko nunyu uneo ya kubi nanao ma. Mahis, shikowa, kam lal, man haru. Hanuku hipai, makipa makus, tapea tan. Gracias, gracias por este mensaje, gracias por esta producción maravillosa que inició con la voz del maestro Leco del pueblo Huichí, Leco Zamora, de la comunidad Huichí de Argentina y que reúne a muchísimas comunidades y lenguas de pueblos originarios, los verdaderos dueños de la tierra, a quienes homenajeamos a través de este saludo. Muchas gracias, Nolan. Thank you so much, Alicia, and, and thank you everyone else for um, attending. Uh, we're about to shift gears into our, our keynote, but I do just want to remind everyone that um, there's some incredible, important, transformative work that we're all going to get to, to take part in over the next couple of days. Um, but I also want to remind us all to, to have fun, enjoy each other's company, um, to screen create some complications, but let's also use it as an opportunity to, to continue the community building. So without further ado, I'm going to shift things over to our keynotes, and it begins the short 16-minute film, and then we will turn it over to Shirley Steinberg. Thank you, everyone. Speaking of Paulo, Donaldo Macedo's words tell us, Paulo always talked about the importance of having an enormous capacity to love in order to carry out the arduous and often difficult task of denouncing the cruel and obscene assaults against human beings who have the least, when it is so much easier and comfortable to accommodate to the power structure from which we can reap benefits. Paulo exemplified his great capacity to love by the coherence with which he lived his life and his unyielding commitment to social justice which gave and continues to give all of us tremendous hope that a discriminatory world can be changed to become more just, less dehumanizing, and more humane, acknowledging always that change is difficult, but it is possible. The absence of an exceptional human being who, while he is no longer here with us in person, is ever more present in our lives in spirit, generosity, and love. Eu não nasci para apenas assistir ao mundo como está. Eu estou aqui e isso me satisfaz como cristão. Eu não posso me compreender cristão de braços cruzados, de jeito nenhum. Mas me, me satisfaz também como pedagogo, como pensador. Quer dizer, eu, eu estou felicíssimo porque sei que tenho um mínimo de possibilidade de mexer na estrutura do mundo. Paulo Freire is part of my life since I was a high school student. 
when I first read his Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Paulo Freire has a huge influence in my work and my life because the ideas of Paulo are not necessarily just an academic or a scientific uh, type of uh, uh, idea or work. They are ways of living. That is a, my way of living. I don't remember how I came upon Pedagogy of the Oppressed. But when I read it, and I started to think about it, and the way he described critical consciousness, which I've now written about, uh, made so much sense to me. It's like good sociology sometimes. Read it, read something, and say, oh my God, that's what I'm doing. I never, I never named it. Apollo's work to me is more important today than it actually was when he produced it, because I, I think the implications it has now for, in some way, addressing the authoritarian forces that are at work in dismantling any notion of critical and public education at both the level of uh, uh, secondary education at the high school level are more intense than anything we have seen before. And if we don't have a language to both understand that and engage it, I mean, I think we're all in trouble. And I think that Paulo in part, while he doesn't make any claim to provide a complete language, he certainly provides a language that would be useful. A language useful for many educators in today's complex society. Writing about Paulo, Henry Giroux tells us, occupying the in-between space of the political and the possible. Paulo spent most of his life working in the belief that the radical elements of democracy are worth struggling for, that critical education is a basic element of social change, and that how we think about politics is inseparable from how we come to understand the world, power, and the moral life we aspire to lead. Committed to the specific, the play of context, and the possibility inherent in what he called the unfinished nature of human beings, Paulo offered no recipes for those in need of instant theoretical and political fixes. For him, pedagogy was strategic and performative. Considered as part of a broader political practice for democratic change, critical pedagogy was never viewed as an a priori discourse to be reasserted or a methodology to be implemented. On the contrary, for Paulo, pedagogy was a political and performative act organized around the instructive ambivalence of disrupted borders, a practice of bafflement, interruption, understanding, and intervention that is the result of ongoing historical, social, and economic struggles. All of us have come up from a revolutionary way of seeing the world, and we all converge in different ways. I think about Paulo, I think about Anna Cruz, about Henry Giroux, Tom Wilson, the people that I work with and, and collaborate with. And we all have our different stories, how we came to Paulo Freire. Certainly Anna, as an indigenous woman from Brazil, has a different background. Henry, in his young, young professorship, had a way of coming and reinterpreting uh, critical pedagogy for the masses that was incredible. Tom Wilson is one of Paulo's oldest friends in, in the English-speaking world, and he sees Paulo as the teacher, almost more as the teacher of children in a lot of ways, teacher of adults in the fields. His work with, with Paulo is grounded in community. And all of us see him in a way that he's meaningful to us, but also he saw us in a way that was meaningful to him. He was never bigger than, he was always part of. You know, he once said to me, he said that he, he, he couldn't really identify with, with revolutionaries, you know, who didn't like good food, you know. And, and I remember when we, we, we would end up in people's houses and he would say, oh, Joe, if the food is bad, we have to leave. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, he just had this passionate sense of life, you know. I mean, he, he had this way of intervening uh, in the relationships around him that suggested something about the fullness of life and its possibilities. I mean, the, everything that Paolo did had a utopian dimension. It meant that every relationship in which he was involved was unfinished. There was more. There was more possibilities, you know. With this experience of meeting him, uh, I found a great deal of congruence in what he consistently said and how he behaved and how pedagogy of the oppressed was structured. And uh, his famous notion of banking education, which now everybody says, but it's easy to say and difficult to practice, particularly in this milieu of standards and 
objects, subjects, questions. To connect with the day-to-day -day occurrences of daily life and reflect about what you see as part of a daily life is one of the major themes of Paulo Freire's work. And that is how I see my work being done as well as a critical pedagogue. I try to instill in my students that same type of attitude that you cannot take for granted the work of an educator and overlook what you do day to day. You have to pay attention in the day to day occurrences to be able to reflect, act and change what is not working, especially what is not working for the disadvantageous uh, uh, piece or segment of society for the people who are not in power or have no power to control their lives. Paulo believed that an educator cannot be viewed as a technician, a functionary carrying out the instructions of others. Educators are learned scholars, community researchers, moral agents, philosophers, cultural workers, and political insurgents. Learning from Paulo's perspective is grounded in the learner's own being, their interaction with the world, their concerns and their visions of what they can become. A inteligência se cria, se constrói, não se recebe, quer dizer, a gente vai construindo a inteligência na luta para compreender e mudar o mundo. É aí que a inteligência se faz, se constrói, se dá. I was a high school teacher who, who basically did not have a theoretical language that I could use to detour my experiences through in order to fully understand them. I felt as if somebody was choking me. You know, I, I felt that for some reason the passion that I had for progressive pedagogy didn't have a language that could express it. Ironically, somebody had given me that day a copy of Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And I, I went home and I read that book. It took me all night. I stayed up till seven in the morning. It changed my life. I mean, I mean, it changed my life because it gave me a theoretical framework to understand what it meant to articulate what I was doing. You know, it provided, in a sense, a foundation, not just simply that I could use in that particular moment, but one that I could build on. I mean, one that forever, in some ways, has influenced different aspects of how I understand what it means to be pedagogically involved, to link learning to social change, right? To, mm -hmm. to take seriously what it means to understand what it means to make something meaningful, to make it critical, to make it transformative to understand why pedagogy is central to politics and not just to teaching. And so that was, uh, you know, that was, that was a real rupture in my life. I mean, it, it was one of those foundational moments where your own sense of the world changes and shifts because you have a language that opens up doors that you had not been aware of before. It breaks into common sense and it gives it meaning. I had high school teachers read Pedagogy Depressed and we started discussions just forever who wanted to show up about what it meant to us and so we continually tried to relate it to our own lives and our own work and our own passions. My original copy I lost and it had all my notes and had everything in it and uh, that was a tragedy because every time I would read it you know, I'd find something new in it in a way as it was continually generating itself, reconstructing itself. I found that most significant, most significant. Critical pedagogy for this time in this era has to have a commitment to society and to oneself. It's creating a well-being of society and a well-being of oneself. It's creating academic health, scholarly health, and our own health. And I, I really do believe that that's something that needs to be added. That's how I am taking critical pedagogy into the future. You know, knowledge was not just simply instrumental. It was crucial to understanding both the conditions of power and the effects of power. So meaning, I was no longer concerned simply about critical, critical thinking as a skill. I was concerned about critical consciousness as a way of getting kids to understand themselves, their relationship to others, and what it meant to act, actively change the world itself. Eu acho que a gente deveria, com, com uma, uma consciência tranquila, mais alerta, desperta, a gente devia a, assumir uma posição de indignação. Quer dizer, a gente deveria ficar indignado, mas não indignado com relação ao favelado que me mata, mas indignado com a situação histórica, política, social, econômica que cria a possibilidade de eu ser morto 
pelo desgraçado. I have never seen anyone on a stage giving a talk like Paulo. I mean, he once told me that he never knew what he was going to say before he gave a talk, and that he would often lie down in the back room or wherever they put him, and he would think for a few minutes about what he was going to say, and, and then, then he would talk. I mean, there is a story about how when he fell in love with his second wife, and all of a sudden love became you know, <laughs> a serious theme in his life. But every talk he gave for about a year, <laughs> he would talk about love, you know, <laughs> that somehow it, it, it sort of wrestled its way into, into the notion of pedagogy. But I, I, I think that what this says about Paulo is that, you know, what he talked about and who he was um, was not something that was remotely anchored in the past. I mean, it was always something that fully engaged him at the moment. And uh, that was very beautiful to see. Nita, amazing woman, changed his life with not only energizing it, but by inspiring him. And he linked that to how he saw our work as people in pedagogy with society, with our students, with our communities. And he said that romantic love needed to truly be linked with community and social love. And he came up with the term, he said, I'd, I'd like to think of it as radical love. And that started a conversation that I've had for the last oh, I don't know, almost 20 years about what radical love could be and how it could be formed into a way that in, includes social justice, empowerment, emancipation, and certainly a social theoretical grounding in what education is and what it can be. Paulo taught us that education is always political and teachers are unavoidably political operatives. Teaching is a political act. Paulo argued that teachers should embrace this dimension of their work and position social, cultural, economic, political, and philosophical critiques of dominant power at the very heart of the curriculum. Quem não briga é quem não tem futuro. E quem não tem futuro não tem presente. Entende? Porque o futuro, afinal de contas, não é, não é uma província que fica distanciada de mim, muito além de mim, à espera de que eu chegue lá. Pelo contrário, eu sou fazedor do futuro. We are not followers. We're people that took something that was amazing and magnificent from Paulo's seed and a lot of Henry's work and how the 80s evolved into critical pedagogy meaning another way, an alternative, a truly social, theoretical, philosophical, intellectual, public discourse on education to meet somebody who uh, was in the world in such a profound and passionate way and had a real sense of that being in the world was, was also about changing it, you know, uh, had an enormous influence on me. I miss him, his humanity, his uh, gentleness, his rigor, and his righteous anger. And um, I think I still have righteous anger also. I think I'm still Trying to carry that out. The legacy of Paulo Freire cannot be underestimated. It's going to be living through me, and I'm also making sure that it is living through my students. Thank you, Paulo Freire, for such a beautiful legacy. Thank you so much for showing our film. It fills me with love and tears and the memories of making the film all over again. Um, I've been asked to do a short keynote to 
kind of kick off the conference. And then we'll open up to our wonderful panel members who have uh, agreed to join us from Eastern Canada and from Colombia. And so it's very exciting to speak with them. I am speaking to you from Western Canada. And I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, Canada, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, as well as the Sina Nation and the Stony Nakoda. The city of Calgary is also the home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And I sit here before you and tell you that all of the land I spoke of is on stolen land and we are on it as people who have intervened in First Nations and Indigenous lives here in Canada. Starting the film with this was a great idea and it wasn't mine, but I was thrilled when I heard they were doing it because indeed my own introduction to Paulo Freire was through film. I was sitting in 19... 87 right here in this city watching a film that my professor David Smith decided we should see and it was called starting from Nina. It was the first film that Paulo Freire had made that was in English it was made in 1970. The film talks about his work in Toronto uh, with the people mostly from the Algarve in Portugal that had come as immigrants and that the kids were in schools, very working class schools, and very often did not understand the, the curriculum. And more importantly, the teachers did not understand that in order to bring the curriculum to the students, they had to reach out and understand the students. The film goes on for about an hour, and he tells the story of being a young teacher in Recife in northern Brazil. He taught the farm workers, the the people that were from around the outside of Recife, they didn't speak particular Brazilian Portuguese, but they sp mostly spoke a, a language that was both indigenous to them with Portuguese colonial influence. His goal and his, and his job was to teach them to learn to read and to write in Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese. Many of the students understood what he was teaching and they had heard about reading and writing and they understood the importance. But there was one significant farmer, a, a man who worked the land, that really didn't understand why Paulo wanted him to go to the board and to put these marks on the board. And he didn't have a cognitive and intellectual connection of why writing was important. Paulo struggled with this guy for quite a while and he just he almost started to think he was failing that he he couldn't reach out to this man. One day the 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 field worker came in sat down in the room and Paulo started the class and just at some moment the man got up walked to the board picked up chalk and he wrote Nina N I N A and Paula was shocked because the man had not written any language. And Paula said, you know, what is the meaning of this? He was very happy, very excited. And the man started to cry, welling up with tears, tears rolling down his cheek. And he said, Nina is my wife. She is the most precious thing to me. She is my love. Paulo talks about the fact that this was the moment that he understood that without context, without meaningful relationships between students and curriculum, they couldn't learn and he couldn't teach. And so this was the first film I saw, the first time I saw Paulo Freire, this man, this amazing man talking about reaching out and connecting. Well, my, my life developed further then, and actually um, I got to know Paulo and uh, went to see him in Boston, went to see him in Brazil, uh, ate at his house, and as Henry said, Paulo loved to eat. In fact, he would judge people and he would say, 
If a man doesn't want to eat, if he doesn't like food, he is not a good person. So I think that that was a great part that we got in that film. Anyhow, today we're connecting how we as people in critical social theory came to understand that media was not being it wasn't being taught appropriate in schools. In fact, in in appropriate manners in schools, we all began if we started teaching 10, 20, 30 years ago by media being how to make the film work, how to put a video in, how to use CDs or DVDs, how to view. More sophisticated programs would show how to film, how to make movies, how to make videos, but very, very few schools had rigorous intellectual criticalized ways to look at media and certainly one of the pioneers of uh, modern day media literacy is going to be someone you're going to hear in the next session doug kellner who is probably my greatest inspiration in media literacy reading media is never easy it is precisely the nature of media to often look like it's innocent, benign, yet be incredibly complex and often insidious, often dangerous. At any rate, the idea of media is to do a list of things, and I was just jotting them down. What, what does media, what do I do with it? Well, there, there are some kinds of people who just take it for what it is. They see it, that's what they see, that's what it is. They don't see anything more or less in it. Um, it's placed before them. It's kind of the type of existential media consumer. What you see is what you get. And then there's people who devour media, who, who eat it up. Media sponges, they live for media. There's those that deny media's existence, deny its importance in, in, the, in the universe. They even want censorship. They claim that it has no effect on anybody, but it's frivolous. And those who are suspicious of media and who critique it. And I hope that we're part of the end, the last group, because we can love it, we can use it, we can exploit it, but we have to understand it. We have to be able to understand the context in which the media is delivered and the context of how, how we accept it. I don't want to essentialize the notion of media consumers and readers, but I, I like to view the viewers. I like to watch the people that are watching and see what they're seeing. I want to see their cognitive, physical, and political ways in which they come from after they see the media. It used to be seen as just a medium for the educated, the privileged, the initiated. And now it's become an essence which surrounds anybody, everybody. We, we, we were always into the idea of how, as many of us are come from a, a leftist background, a Marx influenced background, the notion of how power influences everything and how work and authoritarianism impacts who we are as people. And then we move on a little bit and we started to understand that delivering both wise, important news, delivering insidious news, propaganda is coming from media. But then we went through during the modernist kind of era, we went through the notion that corporations controlled us, that we were totally dominated by money and corporate ways of seeing the world. But then we who started to get gather in media circles in the Kellner School of Media started to understand that indeed the most powerful, significant part of what creates a way of seeing the world in today's society is media. Yet we are equipped in most schools, in most countries with little or no way to comprehend media. Certainly we teach children how to use letters, how to write. We teach them how to maybe learn music. We teach them trades. Uh, you go to welding school to become an electrician. You learn how to do this. But what we very rarely do is teach 
youth and children, adults, how to consume media, how to be suspicious of it, how to be critical of it, how to make sure that the right things are being said, and that if not, we are going to come up against it, we're going to argue with it, and we are going to disagree with it. And that's why we're here today. We're here today to understand that if pedagogy involves issues of knowledge production and transmission, that the construct of subjectivity and popular culture is all guarded and guided and pushed by what happens in media in contemporary world society. The pedagogy of media can not just be the production and consumption. It has to be discussed. It has to be interrogated. And most importantly, it has to be understood and how it shapes the psyche and how we go around the world. If we reject it, I see that also as a problem. I see that rejecting it, not seeing it. I don't listen to t TV. I don't watch this stuff. I don't watch movies. I don't like that stuff. I read books. Well, you know, all the best to people who read books. But if we are not alert to what media is doing in our society with and to citizens in our society, we start to create a world that eventually can be dominated by only what comes out in media. Certainly, in the last six years, the United States of America has been incredibly moved, changed, attacked, and dominated by media by media, by demagogues, and by people who do not have to answer to anything. And that's the key, and I'll finish with that. The key of media, of a, of a concern about media literacy, is that without discourse and critique and ways of seeing media, looking at media, understanding what we see, having conversations without those things happening media can dominate it can become absolutely authoritarian and you know i don't think that 30 years ago when i read huxley for the first time when i read brave new world when when all those works 1980 floor came at four came out those were fictions to me and then chomsky started to say wait a minute wait a minute what we are watching and seeing creates a hegemonic way of seeing the world this is dangerous and then in the last two two decades with people like kellner and Giroux, mclaren other people that have discussed this conversation we know for a fact that media literacy must be used it must be put into our schools. And if they're not going to create a curriculum of media literacy, we need to infuse it at, as teachers, to infuse it into education so that we can have that conversation. So I'm going to end with that right now. And I'm going to introduce our panel. This is hard because it's, I don't see everybody's name that's on there. But what I'm going to do is I'll introduce you the panel. Everyone's bios is on the program, so I won't go into our bios, but I will tell you that these are fabulous human beings and friends um, of mine, people that I care about and um, love. And so I'll first, I'm first going to introduce Juliana Cuccinelli, who has um, worked with me for far too many years than both of us want to admit but she is uh i helped write and directed the film you just saw juliana is the filmmaker and so i'd like to first talk to juliana because i i i wanted to ask her to um do a do a quick five minutes but i want to also talk to her about the making of the film so juliana i'll turn five minutes over to you Perfect. Thank you, Shirley, and thanks again for the invitation uh, to be part of this um, amazing and incredibly 
um, informative uh, conference. It's, an, it's a true honor to be here. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, my bio is, as Shirley said, the bio is in the uh, conference um, information. So I'll, I'll take the five minutes to discuss uh, the film. It's actually, it, it's, it's been interesting sitting here and watching it because as a filmmaker, if you've made films or any form of media, um, the, the fun part, the interesting part is to always watch it a few years later. And that's where I'm at right now. I hadn't seen it for a long time. So it's taken me back to um, a lot of amazing memories. Um, but in, in regards to the documentary, um, what I found really interesting, because Shirley also mentioned it earlier, in particular was Paolo's, Paolo's comment about how important it was for him to always trust someone who um, like to have conversations and talk over good food. Um, and that's how I sort of approached this film. And I know that might sound a bit odd, um, but it was trying to, I didn't know Paolo. So it was trying to tap into what Paolo meant to everyone and anyone that I interviewed and we interviewed several people over many years. Um, everyone just said how humble he was, how welcoming and more important, how loving and caring he was. So to try and bring that forward through this film, um, it wasn't easy. Um, and the advantage I had, the advantage that Shirley and I had is that we had an enormous amount of rich material to work with. Um, I remember digging through archives, um, physically touching the Paolo's glasses, uh, meeting amazing people and instrumental people in critical pedagogy and spending hours and hours um, interviewing them. Um, so trying to find a, that sort of perfect balance of, of rich visuals, sounds, music, the music was so important to try and, and find something that worked really well and respected the sort of message that we were trying to bring forward. Um, the text, the voiceover, um, and the textures as well. Um, so to achieve a documentary that demonstrated our respect, admiration of Paolo, it was sort of like choreographing a sort of a, a perfect dance. Um, so for me, it, it did begin a lot with that photo of Paolo sitting at the table, staring directly at the camera um, and sort of making that eye to eye contact with whoever was looking at that image. That for me was always the, 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 the sort of the balancing act. So trying to make sure that we always came back to that feeling of you were sitting down with Paolo talking to him. Um, and, you know, I mean, again, if I go back to creating the documentary, and surely correct me if I'm wrong, it actually took us over a year, I think, to work on this, if not more. Um, so there, the, there was quite a bit of material to work with and with, I'm sure anybody here will agree with me, interviewing anyone who is a critical pedagogue, they'll go on and on and on and on. Um, so there was definitely a lot of material to, to work with. So it was very specific questions we had. Um, these were interviews that we shot in Spain, in the Netherlands, um, in Canada, in the US, um, all over. So it was really, again, trying to find that perfect marriage of making sure the message got through, respecting Paolo's thoughts um, and, and his work. Um, and, and delivering something that could be used, not just in a university setting, but in a community setting um, that had that sort of modality that it could reach, uh, you know, beyond obviously the ivory tower. I think that for me was, was probably the more important thing um, of, of creating uh, the documentary. Juliana, did you did you mention the music first? Where did you find the music? Because it is it. I've had actually had people ask me just where they could get the music. It was actually through, believe it or not, Anna Cruz, um, because we wanted to use Creative Commons music, but we just we couldn't find anything at the time um, that worked well with the images. Again, I mean, you saw the images. There, there's some really powerful archives there, uh, and I wanted to make sure that 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 again that balance between the images and and the sound um worked well so anna had actually suggested uh that we use uh, silva's music um and we did get permission to to use it so uh we went with it and, and that sort of just became sort of the beat for for the rest of the of of the documentary 
Thank you so much. And I have to say, we did, we did get a nomination at one film festival in. Um, yeah, I did. Where was it? It was like Eastern Europe. Estonia, I think it was. Yeah. It was in Estonia. Yeah, it was pretty arbitrary, but <laughs> um, I know now. Tom Wilson has died since then, but he he was. He, how was he to interview? How were you with Tom? It was interesting with Tom because I think if I'm not mistaken, that day we had a lot of technical issues. And again, it was just myself and Shirley doing doing the interviews. Um, it was a long interview. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Tom actually at one point, he sort of broke down. He, he was crying in the interview. And you sort of caught a bit of it in one of the scenes that we did leave. Um, but again, that's something that that theme just kept coming back. People got so emotional when we were interviewing. Same thing with Anna. Um, and Shirley and, and everyone that we interviewed. There was, you could really, really see that human connection um, that Paolo had with people he met, but also people he didn't, uh, which was incredible for me to, to, to witness that on, on the other side of the camera. Thanks so much, Juliana. Thank the you, next, uh, the next speaker is Astrid Cardona, who comes to us from Medellin in Colombia. Um, I met her when I was there and loved her and loved her work. And I was an examiner on her thesis. And so uh, I've asked her to talk about her, her thesis topic and, and other things. And she's kind of fabulous, lovely, wonderful, brilliant woman. Astrid. Hola Shirley, muchas gracias. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias también a todas las personas y a su disposición por estar acá escuchando estas ideas. Yo debo empezar mencionando un poco acerca del contexto colombiano. Eh, sabemos que la ciudadanía colombiana ha sido afectada directa o indirectamente por un conflicto armado de más de cinco décadas. Y a lo largo de todo este tiempo se ha intentado firmar eh, acuerdos de paz entre los grupos guerrilleros y el gobierno colombiano sin mucho éxito, sin embargo. Hasta que finalmente ya en el año 2016 el presidente Juan Manuel Santos eh, firma un acuerdo de paz con las FARC, el grupo guerrillero más antiguo de Latinoamérica, pero este acuerdo debía ser ratificado por la ciudadanía a través de un plebiscito donde las personas iban a votar si estaban a favor o no de este acuerdo de paz. Y hay que decir que este acuerdo pues representaba un rayo de esperanza para muchas personas en Colombia. Sin embargo, y contrario a todas las expectativas, la mayoría de los votantes dijeron no al acuerdo de paz. ¿Cómo podríamos entender esto? ¿Tiene algún sentido que los colombianos y las colombianas rechacen un acuerdo de paz después de tantos años de guerra y sufrimiento? Pues hay muchos factores que, digamos, pudieron haber influenciado estos sorprendentes resultados, pero las campañas mediáticas para ganar votantes eh, tuvieron mucho que ver eh, con esta histórica decisión. Porque, por un lado, mientras las fuerzas políticas que respaldaban el acuerdo de paz lo presentaban como la mejor opción posible para el país, estaba también el sector de derecha que utilizó un discurso incendiario, manipuló datos, jugó con las necesidades y los temores de muchos grupos poblacionales y generó emociones de odio, de indignación en los votantes. Esta misma situación de manipulación por parte de los medios masivos de Colombia también ocurrió en medio del último paro nacional, donde las personas salieron a marchar contra los altos índices de pobreza y de desigualdad. Mientras que la ciudadanía estaba reportando en las redes sociales el uso desmedido de la violencia por parte de las fuerzas estatales, los medios masivos en Colombia estaban presentando y reportando casi que exclusivamente incidentes de vandalismo por parte de, de las personas que se encontraban en la protesta. Entonces todo esto lo que hace es evidenciar el alto impacto que tienen los mensajes de los medios masivos de comunicación en la opinión pública, en la construcción de la democracia, en las dinámicas de la política en Colombia y obviamente en desestabilizar todos estos procesos de reconciliación. 
y son los medios quienes están en este momento educando a nuestros niños y jóvenes en Colombia frente a esa realidad social y política de su país. Son muy escasos los ejercicios de pedagogía de la memoria en nuestras instituciones educativas para reconstruir los lazos sociales, para escuchar las voces de las víctimas, para evitar la repetición de las mismas tragedias. Entonces, en el imaginario de las personas se están quedando unas ideas preconcebidas acerca de quiénes son los malos, quiénes son los buenos, cuáles son las causas y consecuencias del conflicto, pero todavía no se comprende muy bien cómo resolver esa problemática. Y esto revela también esa necesidad urgente de educar a la ciudadanía colombiana como consumidora crítica de los medios masivos, promover esa actitud problematizadora en nuestros estudiantes para reflexionar sobre lo que ocurre en sus contextos más inmediatos y que se busque cambiar todo lo que no funciona para los grupos sociales menos favorecidos en nuestro país. En esta guerra también hay una batalla que se libra entre diversas narrativas que son antagónicas, ¿cierto? Al, donde algunas formas de violencia se legitiman sobre otras, dependiendo de dónde venga esa violencia. Donde hay algunas personas que se benefician económicamente del conflicto armado y por eso no les conviene que la guerra cese. Donde algunas voces ganan re relevancia en detrimento de otras. Y donde se reproducen una cantidad diversa de de injusticias sociales. Entonces la pregunta es, ¿qué estamos haciendo frente a esta situación? ¿Cómo estamos ligando el aprendizaje en el aula con la transformación social? ¿Cómo estamos promoviendo conciencia crítica en nuestros niños y jóvenes para que se den cuenta que ellas y ellos también pueden ser generadoras de violencia o también pueden contribuir con la construcción de paz? Sin lugar a dudas, los docentes de lenguas extranjeras podemos hacer la diferencia. Podemos hacer una gran contribución en este sentido, podemos buscar estrategias para promover el pensamiento crítico sobre los mensajes de los medios masivos y la manera en que estos están representando la paz y la violencia. Desde la educación crítica para la paz, eh, digamos que se argumenta que la paz se alcanza cuando se abordan esas causas estructurales de la violencia, es decir, cuando se generan condiciones de vida digna para todas las personas, pero esto también requiere un cambio y una transformación en la educación. Reconocemos esa posibilidad también en el campo de la enseñanza y aprendizaje de las lenguas extranjeras y esto implica dejar de ver el idioma simplemente como un instrumento o simplemente como el dominio de unas habilidades lingüísticas y requiere como empezar a verlo en un contexto social, político particular. Empezar a ubicarlo también como un promotor de conciencia crítica, como reproductor de relaciones de poder o como generador de paz y de violencia también. Pero una situación de conflicto como en la que todavía Colombia se encuentra sumergida requiere del compromiso de los docentes de lenguas extranjeras de superar esas visiones instrumentalistas del idioma, trabajar para transformar las mentes de nuestros estudiantes para que ellas y ellos también trabajen por lo que consideran que debe ser un mundo más justo, es decir, un mundo que recoja la mayor suma de felicidad. Eso es. Thank you Astrid. I I'm just wondering because you've got so many <laughs> Your country isn't like, which it is one of the most beautiful and wonderful countries in the world. Lovely, wonderful human beings there. Um, when you have, most people are used to a, a faction or a war with the, the bad guys and the good guys. But in the context of Colombia, as you said, you've got bad guys coming from all kinds of places and it's hard to know who the good guys are. I was gonna, I wanted to know that as far as television goes and media, do all the factions promote themselves or use propaganda? Do they use it through media? I've only, mo I've mostly just seen it in, in, vis in symbols and visible things, but I'm wondering how, if the media is ever employed by the bad guys. Bueno, es posible, habría que analizar también 
eh, esas relaciones de poder que operan entre los medios, los mensajes, el contenido, porque casi siempre se trata de representar en los medios masivos colombianos de pronto las fuerzas estatales como las que son bien intencionadas pero se, digamos que se esconde a veces también esos errores o esas expectativas o esos retos que hay detrás de esos actores armados, por decirlo así. A, las, a los grupos guerrilleros de izquierda también se les ha, digamos, señalado y colocado ciertas etiquetas para tildarlos de comunistas, terroristas o de personas subversivas eh, sin de pronto analizar qué causas hay detrás de un alzamiento en armas en Colombia. Entonces, ¿qué llevó a estas personas a que tomaran las armas? ¿Qué las lleva de pronto a que eh, sigan ciertas ideologías? ¿Y qué las lleva ahora a que muestren una voluntad de cambio y una voluntad de firmar un acuerdo de paz? Entonces, por lo general, las preguntas que nos hacemos también aquí los educadores eh, críticos y quienes buscamos promover como estas ideas en nuestras aulas de clase es también analizar quién está detrás de la creación de esos mensajes, qué intenciones hay detrás de ello. Y si sí, la representación de, de los actores armados en Colombia es bastante hegemónica y eso es lo que hay que empezar a desafiar. Además de que hay unas voces omitidas también en los medios y por lo general son las voces de las víctimas, las voces de las niñas y niños y las voces de los jóvenes. Thank you, muchas gracias. Um, the last speaker is Michael Huxman, a close friend and co former colleague of both Juliana and mine, and a very eminent writer and speaker on media literacy. Hi, Michael. Uh, hi, Shirley. Que bien vele. How, how great to see you today. Um, so, so this is my moment. Um, bueno, le, le voy a dar mis comentarios en español. Y um, hay que quizás uh, voy a prefer preferir no escuchar la directora. Um, pero sigo escuchando, está bien. Pero um, el, el video me trae muy bonitas memorias del Centro Paulo, bueno, el Proyecto Internacional Paulo Mita Freire, Pedagogía um, Crítica. Y, y pues, para que sepan, um, la doctora Shirley Steinberg y yo éramos el, el medio de la tri tribunal doctoral de, de Giuliana Cuccinelli. Entonces aquí tenemos como medio familia. Está muy bonito. También me da mucho gusto, obviamente, a uh, tener estas palabras aquí en frente de todo este mundo de, de académicos y activistas uh, muy impresionantes de todas las Américas, también de España. Entonces, um, un gran gusto. Además, es, ha sido un poco difícil seguir a uh, Astrid por estos comentarios tan um, reales de, del momento en que se, se encuentra Colombia. Entonces, muchísimas gracias también a Astrid. Y bueno, hablando de Paulo Freire y hablando en frente de un público que, donde hay muchos expertos, hay mucha gente que ha leído mucho de Paulo Freire, eso me pone en un lugar de, de humildad en frente a la realidad que hay personas que, que quizás deben estar aquí con la palabra. Entonces uh, es un pequeño reto uh, y tengo aquí a, a mi lado un montón de libros de Paulo y me hubiera gustado leerlos, pero sin embargo me han estado aquí como uh, reconociendo, bueno, dándome este uh, recordatorio que viene ahora la charla. Entonces, son dos cosas que quiero decir. Uno es en términos de la resistencia, la resistencia contra la pedagogía crítica y las nuevas resistencias. Hoy en día en mi aula hay gente que tienen, que estén captado por las teorías de conspiración, que estén con un 
universo epistémico que no quieren dejar entrar a otras perspectivas, otras perspectivas. Y eso nos imposibilita un poco el diálogo. Y bueno, la resistencia no es nuevo y la resistencia siempre ha habido y en la época de Paulo. Entonces es otro reto que tenemos. Pero lo que quiero observar es que en la derecha han apropiado el concepto de concientización y lo llaman la pastilla roja de la película The Matrix. Entonces, cuando alguien se come la pastilla roja, de repente aprende todo, abre y ven, y ven todo lo que ha sido falso y las conspiraciones que existen. Y lo que ha pasado en este momento es que la derecha en Estados Unidos, pero también en Canadá y en otros lugares, han apropiado el espacio de protesta. Es la derecha que protesta contra las, los medios masivos y la propaganda. Es la derecha que protesta contra el gran gobierno y la manipulación. ¿no? Es la derecha que protesta contra las empresas grandes. Es la derecha que protesta contra los grandes farmacéuticos. Entonces se ha revuelto todo. Y eso nos pone en una posición un poco, digamos, irónico, pero también un gran reto. Pero la otra cosa que quería mencionar hoy, eh, volviendo más a, bueno, a Pablo Ferreri, pero también el concepto de, del diálogo sur-norte. Pablo Ferreri ha sido una, un personaje, un um, teorista, un autor de, de gran referencia ha tomado un lugar, por ejemplo, en educación de, lo, de uno de los más importantes pensadores en la historia humana. Así lo pensamos aquí en América del Norte. ¿no? Y me, para mí, en este congreso, me, me animo mucho a, a la, al diálogo que tenemos entre colegas del sur y norte. Y mañana en el congreso magistral sobre educomunicación, Quizás se va a ver un poco más de, de las ideas de Paulo como comunicólogo. Bueno, entonces que, que el concepto de Paulo como educador, que se ve muy fuerte en el mundo del norte, también hay este otro aspecto de, de su, sus teorías y sus, de todo lo que ha hecho, ¿no? que es la comunicación y la comunicación que está en el base y la comunicación que implica el diálogo, etc. Entonces, para unos, una cosa, para terminar mis comentarios, quería mencionar uh, el fallecimiento este año de otro colombiano, de un, un colombiano, Jesús Martín Bavero. Y pienso que de, debemos reconocerlo en este congreso y recordarlo. Um, sus contribuciones, ¿no? uh, el gran libro... Uh, de los medios a las mediaciones, que ha sido mal traducido en inglés. Eso es de 1987, ¿no? Fue mal traducido en uh, Communication, Culture and Hegemony, que es como casi una lista de libros, no un libro específico. Pero Jesús Martín Babero nos enseñó que, que los medios no es solo un fetiche, no es una cosa, sino es un proceso. Que los medios son activos y nos nos entran como un proceso. Y eso ha sido también en la base de educomunicación, ¿no? los medios activos, el uso que, que tenemos sobre los medios y el uso que podemos tener para la liberación, para una conciencia crítica y para el diálogo más que todo. Entonces, pues esas son mis observaciones. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Michael. Um, I was just like, when you talk about the ways of which um, media is used and the notion of resistance, do you have any examples that you can, that are current in your media brain that you see um, present examples of resistance in current, like contemporary work? Well, I'm thinking of, 
resistance to the you know the in the COVID pandemic the the various different ways that people have have risen up and um, uh, resisted whatever the dominant logics of the society. But um, but more recently, I've been looking at the work of you know, the overlap between New Age ideologies and um, say the yogis, yoga practitioners, and their interest in QAnon and their adaptation of QAnon. And, um, and what I've just been looking at is this sort of upside down world where, um, you know, the, the right wing increasingly is appropriating all the space of, of crit critique. And the left, you know, this brings us back to an important chapter by Stuart Hall and um, uh, the state socialism old caretaker, you know, in, in resistance to renewal. You know, this idea that the left is left holding on to these very institutions that the left is critiquing, has been critiquing all these decades. Um, so I'm not sure if that really answers the question of resistance, uh, surely, but it's uh, it's it's this upside down world. That's that's my fascination at present. <laughs> no, it it doesn't. It doesn't. But it's okay because you gave me some ideas when you mentioned that and and Hall. Um, what I was just thinking and listening to Michael and in just in it, what people are saying is and I I am going to bring up a popular culture reference because I'm obsessed with it and this is the Korean um, show uh, uh, TV uh, series called Squid Game which has become the most popular um, television show ever to be viewed and the notion that they use the people who created this created a, in my opinion a comment a very strong comment on authoritarian domination um of uh, due to financial ruin which korea is is famous for uh being taken over basically by the world bank and the americans and different uh people in the 80s and 90s and basically destroying the entire economy and people had a very difficult time in the country telling what was going on but the best thing they've ever done is create this tv show called the squid game and and when you mentioned that when you talked about covid i'm thinking that along with our media literacy that we do a la uh, McLuhan and Hall and Chomsky and Kellner, that it seems to me it's time to really add in the notion of semiotics in tremendous ways because so it's not so much the verbal or even the physical of a TV show or a, an advertisement, but it is it's the the just the visual. It's like we've gone back. In fact, sound isn't as seemingly as important as the visuals are, and and so when you bring up the masks and the notion of the psychosis in North America, at least about who's going to wear a mask and who isn't, and the fact that people are being attacked if they wear masks. Um, the idea that the symbolism and the appropriation of symbolism, especially by the right, has become incredibly significant. I don't know if I said anything, it just sounded like I did. Yeah, these are perfectly formed little universes, epistemic universes. And um, it's, it's almost impossible to sort of uh, enter in and have a conversation. There's an, a, a, the, the, the filter bubble is now more like a rubber ball that bounces you back off. Actually, I like that. That's a fabulous metaphor to end on, Michael. Thank you. I really like that. Um, that will conclude our uh, session. Um, we're going to, we'll all put our emails in on the side if you'd like to contact any of us. And I'd like to urge you all to look at our website. Um, I'm putting it on um, right now, which um, is the freddyproject.org. There are five or six films in there and lots of films and interviews of people that you may know or recognize. So uh, thank you very much. Wishing you health and safety. And maybe uh, this time next year, we'll see each other. Thank you very much.